Well, good morning. I'm Bill Powers, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today for this remembrance, this celebration, this thanksgiving for the life of Dr. William Livingston. And on behalf of the entire University of Texas, I want to welcome everyone to the campus, the campus that Bill Livingston so loved to the Legion faculty members and administrators who are lucky enough to be his colleagues, and to his multitude of alumni admirers, to all of you I say welcome. And finally, to the Livingston family, and most especially to Lana, his wife of 70 years, whom he adored, and who shared him so fully with the rest of us. We give special welcome to you and pray with you and embrace you as cherished members now and forever of our UT family. Many who are here today knew Bill Livingston longer than I did. And that's actually saying something. For I knew him and I served alongside of him and under him for 30 years, 30 years before he became my senior vice president. Nonetheless, I'll leave it to others, others on the program today to characterize his accomplishments in more specific ways. But I would like to say about him simply this. Bill Livingston was to the University of Texas what Barton Springs is to the city of Austin a never-ending source of refreshment and enjoyment. The essence of what is unique and best about our community. A fixture on our landscape, the time before which none of us can remember. A treasure we cannot picture our community without. Few besides him have given their lives so completely to our university, and none have better embodied his ideals. For roughly the last half of the university's entire history, he served and guided this institution in ways that can never be fully measured. But like you, what I'll miss most about him is his personality. I'll miss his booming voice and his mischievous smile. The way he grabbed your arm while talking to you. His famous eloquence and his humor and his integrity. Bill, thank you for a lifetime of service and for your example. You're in a place now where you no longer need luck. 
but I'd re be remiss if I didn't say it too. Goodbye, Bill, and good luck. Well, here is my exhortation and here is my advice. One, don't ever be afraid to use your minds merely because it is not popular. Two, don't ever feel sheepish about wanting to be good at what you do. You must try to be the very best at what you do. Three, don't ever hesitate to be literate, even if it marks you as a bit eccentric. If you can read and write, admit it. Four, people often try to get by the easiest way possible. Don't do that. Do it right. Do it fully. Do it with pride. And finally, always remember this. Five, there is no tyranny and no failure quite so great as the habit of accepting second best from oneself. And so, my friends, my message is simple. You've got it, so put it to use. Don't flaunt it, but take pride in it. Don't scorn your fellow citizens, but always help in the business of the community. Whatever your line of work, all of you must be aware, alert, and active. Well, I must bring this to a close. And in doing so, I have a parting word for all of you. Do remember that this is your home, the place where you made friends and came of age, a place that will be part of you forever and of which you will forever be a part. Remember to come home now and then, both in spirit and in fact. Wherever you go, send us a postcard now and then, along with your check, and we will keep you in our hearts. <laughs> ah, yes, there's one other thing I almost forgot. Goodbye and good luck. I am Harry Middleton, former director of the LBJ Library. Bill and Lena were the best friends and the first friends that my wife Miriam and I made when we came to Austin in 1969. We were introduced by President and Mrs. Johnson. It was an auspicious beginning to a friendship that over the following years brought so many pleasures and satisfactions and personal rewards. In addition to uh, all of the sterling qualities that Bill Livingston was known for and widely recognized for. <clears throat> for me, there is something else, something intensely personal. It is inevitable that I think of Bill in terms of his connection with the LBJ Library. In his voluminous curriculum vitae, his association with the library is summarized in 11 lines. But those 11 lines represent a momentous contribution which has benefited my life. When I became director of the LBJ Library, President Johnson gave me a special and somewhat daunting mission. Integrate us into this university, he told me. We're pretty controversial. Make us part of it. That was pretty daunting, but Bill was my introduction to the university, and for three decades, he was one of the principal agents of his, of his of in, it, the library's integration. In the beginning, he helped develop programs of popular interest and importance to be co-sponsored by the university and the library. He took part in many of those programs and enlisted other members of the academic community to serve with him. That was the beginning, and what followed was much, much more. His counsel, his reputa representation on our behalf, his participation in the life of the library prompted Lady Bird once to call him 
our eloquent and indispensable voice in the tower. Whatever distinction the OBJ Library has achieved in the years rests in generous part on Bill Livingston's interest and contribution. I have abundant reason to be grateful to him for that. But beyond all of this, Bill was a friend, a good friend of generous spirit. Several months ago, on a Sunday, my children and grandchildren and I were visiting in the lobby at Westminster. Bill came by. He knew my kids, of course, and now he became known to my grandchildren and they to him. He talked to them for a long time. He talked about me, about the library, about uh, our times together, significant times, like the time we brought the Magna Carta to the library, and another occasion when we brought the grandson of Winston Churchill, and the conference we had on the breaking of the German World War II code at Bletchley, with its dramatic moment when a member of the audience revealed that he had been there and had helped with the breaking of that code. And he talked to of the private, if not necessarily quiet times, like the Sunday brunches with Lena and Miriam and other friends around the pool. He had them captivated. Even I was entranced, and I had lived through it all. It was not the erudite Bill Livingston, or the witty one, who took this occasion to give a young, rapt audience a sense of what those years had been like for all of us and what they had meant to us. It was the man whose friendship and support had enlarged and enriched my life. I will not forget him. Thank you. I'm Mike Gillette. I had a glimpse of Bill's earlier life when we spent an afternoon together in Columbus before the Ohio State football game. We drove along Broad Street where he had once sold newspapers on the street corners and where he had worked as an usher in the movie theater. We explored the leafy North Arlington neighborhood where he had met the love of his life on a blind date. Lena. And finally, we visited the campus, including Page Hall, where Bill had been studying when he learned the news of Pearl Harbor. Soon after I returned to Austin, I received a phone call from a development officer at Ohio State asking about Bill as a prospective donor. He did, after all, have two degrees from Ohio State before earning his doctorate at Yale. But my advice was not encouraging. He may be a Buckeye by pedigree, I explained, but his blood is burnt orange. When Emmett Redford and the other UT faculty recruited Bill Livingston and Jim Roach at the American Political Science Association meeting in Chicago in 1948, they could not have imagined that these recruits would become two of the most beloved professors on this campus or that their combined tenure would total more than a century. But the Texas taxpayers certainly got their money's worth on that recruitment trip, regardless of the bar tab. What a, what a successful trip that was. Bill Livingston personified the University of Texas. Its breadth of learning, and vision, its embrace of innovation, as well as its respect for tradition, and above all, its spirit of inclusiveness. In his six decades on this 40 acres, he gained a singular knowledge of the campus, mastering its labyrinths of offices and regulations and befriending its countless employees. He knew just who to call for anything. And when Bill called, the answer was always yes. It was yes because he personalized this large university as only Bill Livingston could. No student was a stranger to him. No employee, no matter how low in the pecking order, was beyond the grasp of his friendship. 
Consequently, when you walked across the campus with Bill, the trip took twice as long because everybody wanted to stop and visit with him as he did with them. Although a recognized scholar of federalism and comparative politics, he was at heart a teacher who inspired his students. And yet his remarkable people skills propelled him into the leadership ranks just as the university was taking off. Department chair, vice chancellor, vice president, and dean of graduate studies for a decade and a half, and even acting president for a time. And with these portfolios, he was involved in some of the greatest enhancements on this campus and beyond. The creation of the LBJ School of Public Affairs, the Perry Castaneda Library, the Michener Center, and the University of Texas at San Antonio, just to name a few. But whatever the organizational endeavor, Bill's strengths were always evident, just as they were during his six years on our Humanities Texas board. His perceptive analysis identified and brought into focus all the key issues, while his vision raised our sights and our aspirations. His very positive, co congenial enthusiasm energized every meeting. At near the end of his long career, Bill returned to the classroom to teach the freshman seminar. After one class, a student confided that he was taking the course because his father, a former Livingston student, had insisted that he do so. Bill remembered the father and recalled visiting with him at an alumni event. And there he had learned that the father's father had also been a student of Bill's. <laughs> and had encouraged his son, the father of the freshman, to take the class. Now, how many educators have the satisfaction of teaching three generations of students? There are thousands of us on this campus that loved and admired Bill Livingston and will miss him dearly. So will his legions of former students who owe him a debt beyond measure. We will miss that wealth of knowledge and experience that kind thoughtfulness and, and his just the zest of life that he exuded. We'll miss that sonorous voice that dispensed wise counsel and charming witticisms. And when all else failed to force a smile, there was that repertoire of naughty limericks. <laughs> but most of all, we'll miss the magical glow of his friendship. I am Tom Hatfield. Conversations over dinner with Bill Livingston were never about the weather, automobiles, money, grievances, ailments, or himself, unless others insisted. Rather, his conversations were about ideas and events, books, writers, and politics, American and British history, the war, the university, and personalities without bias, except for a few. Rather than dominating conversations, he built on his companion's observations, inserting his own comments, chuckling and spicing it all with witticisms, insights, and more topics to discuss. If someone verged on an intemperate outburst, he might utter softly, careful now, and the words hate and resent were not in his everyday vocabulary. If he had heroes, they were Winston Churchill and Harry Ransom, and he spoke vividly about them. Certain of Bill's friends he called bon vivants, a French term for one with refined taste and who enjoys life, which described himself as well. He respected quality in every aspect of human endeavor, and he could be visibly awed by a truly virtuoso performance, especially of the mind. If Bill had a hobby, it was words. He was word struck fascinated by the use, misuse, abuse, and meaning of words in English and French. They were the common thread of his vocation, teaching, and his avocation. He was intrigued by the sound and the appearance of words. 
and his fascination for words explains much about him, beginning with the fact that he was seldom at a loss for them and always eager to share them. Stringing them together, he could be eloquent, entertaining, persuasive, even captivating, and sometimes verbose. So fond was he of discussing words with good company that he inspired a group for that very purpose. The group was called the Verbal Files. Not a proper word, but one signifying a love of the language. And Bill described the Verbal Files as, quote, a dozen or so fellows who met a couple of times a year to talk about language, share biases, and exhibit intolerance of Philistines. Within the verbal files, he said, ignorance was never a bar to the assertion of authority. <laughs> he encouraged verbal files to collect limericks, epigrams, and interesting facts about words as he did. Occasionally, you would get an envelope from him stuffed with clippings or notes about words that he had just found. At, on August the 3rd, 2004, he sent us a handwritten memorandum addressed to, and I quote, Two verbal files from lovable tyrant. <laughs> and then this note, here's a potpourri of stuff that I've been accumulating with you in mind, signed only with his initials, WSL. Enclosed were several reports, some scholarly and some not so scholarly. There was a new computer analysis of Shakespeare's vocabulary that he used 17,677 different words in his plays, as compared to only 5,642 words in the Old Testament. Another concerned the, the winning entry in a contest for the worst opening sentence in a novel of the previous year. <laughs> Several <laughs> verbal files and other friends of Bill might be invited to gather in celebration of a major historical event. The gatherings would typically occur on the anniversary of the event, like the destruction of the Spanish Armada on August the 8th, 1588, or the Norman conquest of England, are most memorable for me on the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar. On October 21st, uh, 2005, we met to discuss the triumph of the British Navy in that battle over the combined fleets of the French and the Spanish fleets. It's too bad that Admiral Lord Nelson was killed in the battle, but we could still gossip endlessly about his affair with Lady Hamilton and the whereabouts of her husband. Bill took merciless delight in finding words that had been ludicrously misused in headlines and advertisements as in this one for a retirement home in New York, for the sick and tired of the Episcopal Church. <laughs> and this headline, Queen Mary having her bottom scraped. <laughs> but for all of Bill's preoccupation with words, there was one memorable instance when words failed him or more exactly, his voice failed him. It occurred in 2001 when he received the Texas X's Distinguished Service Award. His acceptance included an expression of his affection for the university. But if you were there, you didn't hear it. Because overcome with emotion, he could not complete his last lines. And from my closing, I will read what he planned to say. And these are his words. I feel tonight as though I'm walking on a cloud. And I want to tell you the view from up here is spectacular. Some of you have suggested that I should write a history of the university or prepare my memoirs. I will leave that to others. But if I were writing a history, I would speak of a great institution, growing in grandeur, one with a remarkably rich past, an exciting present, and a future without bounds. This special place, this home of intellectual triumph and of storied memories has proven to be remarkably adaptable, surviving and transcending tumult and tragedy, tranquility and turmoil, the eccentric and the egocentric, and personalities 
both noble and perverse. Over the years, as the university has got bigger and better, I have progressed from the callow to the mellow. And I have come to view my commitment to the university as rather like a successful marriage. You keep falling in love again and again, but always with the same woman and always with the same university. And so tonight, let me say it one more time. I love you all. Goodbye, sweet prince. I'm Roger Lewis, uh, History, British Studies, and I suppose I should say the American Historical Association. Uh, when I began to think about what I might say about Bill, I went to the most obvious place to refresh my memory, the collection of autobiographies we published about 10 years ago, about 60 full autobiographies and a book of 942 pages called Burnt Orange Britannia. Uh, I thought to myself, well, here is the place where Bill would have bared his soul and told us things that would otherwise have passed unnoticed in his life. So I picked up the book and it wasn't there. Uh, and then it all came back to me uh, Bill and I had had a long discussion over a period of weeks in which, unlike his usual self, he was very evasive. And he finally said to me, Roger, I can't do it. And I said, what do you mean, Bill, you can't do it? You can't write your own autobiography? That's absurd. And he said, no, it isn't. I would have to tell the truth. And I said, Bill, that's equally absurd. You always more or less tell the uh, truth. And he said, no, I would say things that might hurt Laureen's feelings. That is to say, he might hurt the feelings of Laureen Rogers. Uh, well, I knew Laureen, and I thought she was a pretty tough old bird, quite capable of taking on criticism. Uh, but Bill said, no, not in her lifetime. Uh, well, Laureen lived to be 94, and thus she didn't give Bill much time to publish his thoughts about her. Uh, but I think that the episode reveals a gentle, kind, and generous personality. And on the other hand, I think it's important to bear in mind that Bill would, whenever necessary, make bold and firm uh, decisions. Uh, there's no doubt that it was a disappointment at not becoming president of UT rather than acting uh, president. This was a bitter moment for Bill, but I remember the day everyone got the news. And that evening with Bill and Lena, a small group uh, with Bill's sense of humor and good nature uh, prevailing over a very gloomy discussion. And I remember Bill roaring with laughter when someone said that he would always be remembered as the best president that UT never had. <laughs> I think this confirmed Lena's view that Bill might have done better as a lawyer or a doctor. Uh, then they wouldn't have had to put up with academic politics. But by not becoming president, Bill was able to give to the university years and years of guidance and experience as vice president that far surpassed a term or two that he would have had as president. I want to say a word about Bill's intellectual interests, especially as they became clear in British studies, uh, but I also want to mention that he steered the government department towards more representative governance and away from civil war thus making the government department something that resembles a normal department. <laughs> uh, 
In passing, I also want to say that he did play a key role, as has been mentioned, in the creation of the LBJ School, uh, the Minster Center for Writers, the Clark Center for Australian and New Zealand Studies, and of course, British Studies. And here is where I want to place my emphasis, but since I began in a certain vein, I can't resist mentioning a couple of other episodes uh, that reveal not only Bill's sense of humor, uh, but his sense of the absurd. Uh, when he thought about his wartime experience in conversations, for example, at British Studies, he didn't spend much time talking about his bronze star and purple heart, but about the order he received every day to sit on a toilet seat to warm it up for his commanding officer. <laughs> so it was the sense of the absurd uh, that was part of an analytical and perceptive mind. And I can't help but saying uh, that Lena's sense of humor ran parallel in a slightly different way. I always uh, tried to sit next to Lena at official uh, university dinners where I would at least be assured of an interesting uh, conversation. At one of them, uh, listening to a speaker who was excruciatingly boring, she leaned over to me and said, isn't he a fraud? <laughs> and I laughed so hard uh, that people looked at me as if I had discovered something interesting in a quite boring speech. Uh, I'll give a couple of examples of his intellectual curiosity and breadth of interest simply by citing the titles of some of the talks that he gave to the British Studies Seminar. Uh, federalism, the comparison of the British and American systems of government, the idea of federalism, the distribution of power in government, the tension between central authority and the constituent units, this was at the heart of Bill's academic research. The British legacy in contemporary Australian politics, Britain and the future of Europe, the author, his editor and publishers, problems of the University of Texas Press, the wartime reputations of Churchill and Roosevelt with Alessandra Lapucci, Harry Middleton, and Walt Rostow, a reassessment of Britain and the partition of India 30 years after, Margaret Thatcher, and the future of British politics. Joan of, Joan of Arc and the English. I think this gives you some idea of Bill's intellectual sweep and gives a hint at least why he was regarded as a dedicated teacher as well as scholar. Uh, Bill was warm and generous with a sharp mind and a dedication to UT that was and remains unsurpassed. My name is Larry Faulkner. I'm honored to have been invited by the Livingston family to offer some remembrances here today. To Lena and Steve and David and members of the larger Livingston family, let me express my sympathy over your deep loss. Bill lived long and very well. All of us can celebrate the great successes of his life but a family's love and loss cannot be compensated by ceremony or by words. The loss remains and requires healing. In the next few moments, I hope to draw Bill Livingston back among us, at least poetically, through a few recollections and observations. In a career extending over almost exactly 64 years from his entry 
as a new faculty member in the Department of Government. William S. Livingston became a central figure in the life of the university, one of its indispensable personalities and leaders. President Robert M. Birdall memorably extolled him as the conscience, the soul, the memory, the wit, the wise elder statesman of this institution. Let's think for a moment how Bill Livingston made such an extraordinary journey. Out of the blue, a young man once asked me, you're an institution guy, aren't you? And without hesitation and without thinking, really, I replied, yes, I am. Institutions are the means by which civilization is conveyed across generations. This brief exchange happened not here at the university, but just three or four years ago with a quick and able colleague at Houston Endowment. I've turned it over in my mind many times since. Was I right? in my surely reactive claim about the role and effect of institutions. Upon every revisitation, I've decided so. Institutions do seem to me to be the principal means by which civilization is conveyed, and at the core, that's why they merit our care and why dedicated people care for them with lavish commitments of their own lives and treasure. Over the past couple of weeks uh, since we lost Bill Livingston, this little story has pushed itself into my mind repeatedly. For Bill was an institution guy, if there ever was one, and he cared lavishly for this institution. We've heard today of Bill's great belief in the University of Texas. I recall a speech in which he once said, strikingly simply, that he loved what it is what it does, and how it does it. But Bill's dedication to institutions did not stop at this university. His scholarship was focused on institutions of self-government in America and elsewhere in the world. And as everyone knows, Bill had an exceptionally warm spot in his mind for things British, especially British institutions, why he even gave regular lectures on the kings and queens of Britain. Surely Bill loved Britain because of its ancient and venerable institutions, but I suspect that also figuring into his regard were his unabashed fondness for style and ceremony, his pleasure in the proper use of the English language, and his ability to recognize and very likely even to appreciate British human. I was a latecomer in Bill's life, so I can't be entirely sure how he became an institution man and how in particular he became so committed to the university, but I do know some important things about him. Bill's service in the United States Army during the Second World War seems to have been fundamental informing his worldview. He was impressed as a young man by the enormously consequential achievements of the Democratic allies, and he was proud, too, of having had a personal part in the effort. Bill's war experience seemed to fuel a lifelong optimism about what can be accomplished by well-led, open communities. And then, too, Bill Livingston came of age as a citizen of this community when Harry Ransom was ascendant from Dean of Liberal Arts in 1954 to Provost in 57 to President in 1960 to Chancellor in 61, serving through 1970. Bill was even a Vice Chancellor with Harry Ransom. In these years, Ransom, more than any other figure, formulated a brightly ambitious vision for the future of the university. Surely it resonated with a young Bill Livingston, for it was about graduate education, great libraries, special collections, quality in learning, and academic standards of the first order. Besides, Ransom seemed to have a gift for expression that could match up to Bill Livingston's love of language. And then to boot, 
Ransom laid out in a well-remembered speech a vision for a Bibliothèque Nationale of Texas. Not only was the idea fascinating and truly Texan in essence, but Ransom's choice of phrase also gave Bill a chance to translate the vision to his fellow Texans from the French. Actually, Bill and I never discussed in any detail his personal reaction to Ransom's proposal and leadership, but just look at the matchup between the priorities advanced in that time and those of Bill's own career as an academic leader. It was an exciting era here, and Bill's dedication to the institution must have been reinforced by his natural optimism that great things, these very things, could be achieved in fact, Bill played a very strong hand in achieving them, especially directly in the life of the British Studies Program, the Normandy Scholars, the founding of the School of, LBJ School of Public Affairs, the Michener Center for Writers, and other activities. Bill's commitment to Texas was surely augmented in a different way by serving as the voice of Tex the telephone registration system used by every student for quite a few years. Bill was blessed with a wonderfully warm voice, and he cultivated diction and timing. Someone in the university years ago had the courage to ask a vice president to become the anonymous voice of the new registration system, and Bill had enough of a sense of humor to agree. He grew to love with a new identity. Of course, students did not actually associate him in any personal way with their automated telephonic friend, for students do not know who vice presidents are. <laughs> but they would perk up when they heard Bill speaking to them in groups, especially if he ever uttered the phrase that closed every telephone session with texts, goodbye and good luck. If ever those words left his lips before a crowd of students, a quick wave of recognition, and then a cheer would pass through the group. You saw it just earlier today. I loved to watch the little game, and Bill relished it indeed. There's no time here to recount the long list of specific contributions that William S. Livingston made to this community. Let me just say that in the councils of leadership, he was for half a century a marvelous advocate for ambition with style. All of us here feel sadness because we've lost our great friend, a chip from the very bedrock of the university. But the eyes of Texas sparkle, even today with the recollection of a son who lived with verb, with ambition, with style, with goodwill, and with fine humor. Bill Livingston pushed us, his colleagues, toward greater heights, but also helped us to have some fun on the ride. I think I still see him smiling broadly on us. And in a quiet moment this morning, I heard goodbye and good luck. I'm Steve Livingston, one of Bill Livingston's two sons. On behalf of my brother David and my mother and our families, uh, I thank you for coming today to honor Dad. We thank the speakers, uh, their presence here and their participation in this service today is a very high honor to Dad. We're going to have a reception upstairs on the 10th floor after the service in the atrium room, and you're all invited. We've heard some wonderful sentiments today about my father and his life at the University of Texas. Speaking for the family, we agree with them. <laughs> Sounds like the same man we knew at home. Home was a house full of books 
and ideas and talk, nurtured by mom and dad and their love and support for each other. Dad was a great father. His personality disarmed those around him very quickly. Even his two-year-old great-grandchildren sensed early on that this was a man who could be teased and played with. My family is grateful that we had uh, Bill Livingston as our father, as our husband, as a grandfather and a great-grandfather. Dad officially retired in 2007. And I read where uh, Supreme Court Justice David Souter, when he retired, said this. For most of us, the very best work that we do sinks into the stream very quickly. We have to find satisfaction in being part of the great stream. I thought that was an interesting statement and struck me as a very humble thing for a United States Supreme Court justice to say about his own life. It made me think. I never heard Dad talk about his legacy, but I think in Justice Souter's terms, Dad believed that his best work was not going to sink quickly into the stream. His life was spent educating in the broadest sense, and he believed all his adult life that in our society, good works of educators live on. And I know he found satisfaction in being part of the great stream. He enjoyed it immensely. And many of the rest of us in that stream are very happy he was with us. For us, his presence was life enhancing. Finally, a few years ago, Dad mentioned that he would like America the Beautiful to be sung at his memorial service. So we're going to honor that request today with the help of this fine quartet from the Butler School of Music. We've asked the violinist to play the first verse as a solo, allowing each of us silently to reflect on the life of William Livingston. Then after the solo, we'll all stand and when the quartet joins in the second time through, we'll join together and sing the hymn. Dad would love this. Thank you. <laughs> 